Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about the great period of European history called the Enlightenment, in which um, Europeans believed they were getting rid of what they saw as the darkness and the ignorance of the Middle Ages, and striking out in bold new directions um, in terms of science and other fields of knowledge, seeking the truth in a new enlightened way. The Enlightenment itself doesn't really begin until the late 17th century and uh, really comes into its own in the 18th century, but uh, it was preceded by a period that historians call the Scientific Revolution, in which everything that Europeans thought they knew um, about the natural world was turned upside down. And one of the key figures in that scientific revolution was a man named Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus was from Poland. He was a cleric. That means that even though he wasn't a priest, he had received some of the holy orders on the way to becoming a priest. And so uh, he was a Catholic and uh, he worked for uh, the Catholic Church. But um, Copernicus's views on astronomy, uh, he was an astronomer, led him to question some of the Catholic Church's teachings about how the universe was organized. Now, you have to understand that up to this point, for thousands of years, people had believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that the sun, all the planets, and all the stars revolved around uh, the Earth. We call this the geocentric or Earth-centered view. But in his observations of the heavens, um, Copernicus became convinced that actually not the Earth but the Sun was at the center of the universe. Now, contrary to popular belief, there were quite a few Catholics who uh, accepted Copernicus's views, and some of them even encouraged him to publish um, his data on this, but Copernicus knew it would be hugely controversial, and so he waited to publish until he was literally dying in the year 1543, and then he allowed his book called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres uh, to be printed for the first time. And what this book sets forth is the heliocentric system of Copernicus. That means that for Copernicus, um, the sun was at the center of the universe. Now, it's important to realize that Copernicus, according to modern scientific views, was wrong about many things. Uh, modern astronomers don't believe the sun is at the very center of the universe. They see it as just one star um, among many. Um, also, Copernicus believed that the planets uh, and the stars revolved around the sun in perfectly circular orbits. And uh, as we'll see, uh, modern astronomers also dismiss that. So um, Copernicus didn't have the absolute truth about the universe by any means. But um, his teaching that, in fact, the Earth was not at the center of everything was a very important step towards the modern model of the universe held by scientists. Another very important um, astronomer of the scientific revolution was from Denmark. His name was Tycho Brahe. And um, in 1572, Brahe reported on a really earth-shattering event uh, for the people of Europe. Uh, suddenly, one night in 1572, what they thought was a new star suddenly appeared in the heavens, blazing with uh, bright light. And so they called it a nova, or, which means new in Latin. And why was this so earth-shattering? Well, according to the old astronomical views, the stars were all mounted on a crystal sphere <laughs> which um, revolved around the earth. They were fixed and they were never changing. So the idea was that uh, 
the sphere of the stars could never change. It was absolutely fixed from the beginning to the end of time. And yet suddenly what looks like a new star um, appeared. And that really blew everybody's mind um, in Europe. Uh, of course, we know now what a nova is. It's actually um, an old star at the end of its life cycle that eventually um, explodes, like our own sun will do um, someday, and, and, and puts out a huge burst of energy, um, appearing very bright in the sky. But, uh, of course, people didn't know that at the time, and it really challenged this new star their, uh, their deeply held beliefs. How is it possible that a new star could appear in this supposedly unchanging realm uh, of, of the stars? So the Nova of 1572 really produced what we could call a cognitive crisis. Um, when people come across new data that shatters their deeply held beliefs, um, it, it causes a crisis, you know. We're actually very conservative creatures for the most part. We like to have things orderly and uh, pattern, and um, we like to think we understand how things work. And when, uh, when new information comes along that destroys our pattern, um, we go into crisis, okay. And so the Nova really produced a climate of skepticism throughout Europe. What is skepticism? Uh, skepticism is when you doubt or question um, deeply held beliefs, like religious beliefs, for instance. Um, and so after the Nova, people began to really question everything about the received uh, models of reality that had been passed down to them from their ancestors for thousands of years. And, and that's a very unsettling state um, to be in. Now, like Copernicus, Brahe was not right <laughs> about everything. Um, uh, looking at Copernicus's data, he came up with a new theory to account for them. Um, he said, well, uh, maybe all the other planets besides the Earth orbit the Sun, but the Sun and all the other planets are still orbiting around the Earth, which is still at the center of um, the universe. Another astronomer named Johannes Kepler um, made an important dis innovation when he said, yes, Copernicus was right, all the planets are orbiting the sun, but they're not orbiting in a perfect circle, they're orbiting in an ellipse, kind of an oval uh, shape. And this is the view that uh, astronomers hold uh, today. Well, I said that um, skepticism is a very un, un, uncomfortable state to be in. We like to think we know how things work. And the great Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei set out to try to rebuild the picture of the universe in a way that was absolutely certain, to try to restore certainty to people's minds about it. And the way he was going to do this was through the use of mathematics. Now, um, in a way, math is the most pure uh, of all human fields of endeavor. It, it, it seems to be capable of sure and certain proof. Um, and so Galileo wanted to use mathematics to try to prove the Copernican theory especially. He did accept that the Earth and the other planets um, revolved around the Sun. However, even though he was trying to restore certainty, his data, which he gathered by using a newfangled instrument called the telescope starting in 1609, only added to the great sense of doubt and skepticism people felt about the evidence of our uh, senses. <clears throat> For example, uh, when we look at the moon, uh, we see the dark blotches on it, but uh, fundamentally, doesn't it look uh, perfectly round, kind of like um, a billiard ball on a pool table? But when Galileo looked at the moon through his telescope, he realized that there were actually high mountains and deep valleys on the moon, that it wasn't a um, perfect sphere. And uh, so in this way, he challenged people's preconceptions based on their own senses. Um, with his telescope, Galileo was also the first to observe uh, the moons orbiting around Jupiter, 
uh, the planet Jupiter, and uh, he was also the first to describe and identify sunspots, flares of radiation coming from um, the surface of the sun. And uh, he used his telescope to try to, to support the Copernican theory. But in a way, isn't that the ultimate denial of our senses? I mean, after all, we stand outside, we look at the sun, and it really does look like the earth is standing still, doesn't it? And the sun is moving. That's what we see. But um, Galileo, like Copernicus, believed that that wasn't true, that in fact the Earth was going around the Sun, the Earth was moving. Um, and that is the ultimate challenge to our senses, all right? So again, people were left disturbed and unsettled by the idea that our senses um, were not trustworthy, and that only contributed to the climate of doubt and skepticism. Now. You've probably heard of Galileo's famous trial and how he was convicted um, by the Catholic Church for teaching that the earth revolves around the sun. And uh, that did happen, but there are a lot of myths about the way that it happened. Um, first of all, Galileo uh, was not put to death. <laughs> he was not executed um, for believing in the Copernican theory. Um, he was not even convicted of, of heresy. Um, what had happened earlier in his career, Galileo had promised the Catholic Church that he would not teach that it was absolutely certain that the earth moved around the sun, that he would only teach it as a theory that was unproven. But in 1632, <clears throat> um, he came out with a book, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, in which he seemed to state categorically that um, it was absolutely scientifically proven that the earth moved around the sun. And the Catholic Church was not ready to accept that uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, the Bible seems to suggest that it's the other way around, that the sun moves around the earth. For instance, there's a uh, passage in the book of Joshua where the sun stands still for a while implying that it's moving. Um, and the Catholic Church really couldn't afford to doubt the Bible at this point because they, after the Reformation, they were engaged in a life or death struggle for survival with Protestant groups um, who all believed very much that the Bible was literally true. Um, and so the Church didn't want to back away from um, saying that the Bible was completely literally true. And so uh, the Catholic Church put Galileo on trial. He was convicted of vehement suspicion of heresy, and the sentence was that he had to renounce his views, which he did. He signed a paper saying he uh, rejected his, the Copernican theory. And then he had to retire to his own very luxurious estate <laughs> and live under house arrest for the rest of his life, where he continued to do scientific experiments and in fact even secretly published some of his works. So um, the punishment of Galileo was not nearly as severe um, as you might think. However, under Pope John Paul II, in the year 2000, the Catholic Church did apologize um, for getting it wrong about Galileo Galilei. Well, once again, people were shaken in their beliefs, and they were looking for some ground of certainty. Um, and so really, the Enlightenment uh, that came after the Scientific Revolution is about uh, European thinkers trying to rediscover some basis on which to be certain <coughs> about how the universe works. And um, to achieve this, they really emphasized an old theory uh, from the earlier Christian tradition, the theory of the natural law, sometimes called the law of nature. Now, the natural law is not a scientific law, like the law of gravity, or the laws of physics, or the laws of thermodynamics. The natural law in the Christian tradition is God's moral law for human beings. Um, the natural law is a set of precepts um, that God gives to every human being in the world, whether or not they're Christian, 
um, to tell them how to live. And um, this idea was an old idea. So in many ways, the Enlightenment didn't actually shatter everything that went before. It did build on earlier tradition. Um, in fact, in presenting the natural law to you, I'm going to use the list of the five elements of natural law compiled by St. Thomas Aquinas um, in the 13th century, which enlightened thinkers also accepted. According to St. Thomas, the first um, principle of the natural law, the one that all the others are built on, is the principle of self-preservation. What does this mean? It means that you and I um, have built into us by God the desire to preserve our own lives at all costs. Um, and uh, if you think about it for a few minutes, you can sort of see the logic of this. Um, when you think about the great extremes that people will go to in order to um, preserve their own lives when in danger. And the, uh, I like to use the example of Aaron Ralston. Um, yeah, have you ever heard of Aaron Ralston? He was a rock climber, <clears throat> and in the year um, 2002, uh, he went um, rock climbing in a canyon in Utah, and he got his arm stuck between a boulder and uh, a, a, a rock wall, and he couldn't get it out, and he was stuck there. And he stayed there for 127 hours. There's actually a movie about this uh, man called 127 Hours, very good film, um, about this ordeal. And finally, after 127 hours, he realized he was going to die of thirst and starvation if he didn't get out. And so he took um, a very dull knife that he had in his backpack, and Aaron Ralston sawed off his own arm at the elbow. Um, to get out of that predicament because he knew that that was the only way to preserve his life, to go through that horrible pain. Um, and he survived, and he's, he's, he's still alive, so he succeeded in that. But I, I think that shows the great lengths that we'll go to to preserve our own lives under uh, distress. <clears throat> Related to this desire to preserve our own lives is the human desire for marriage and children um, how is that related? Well, if you think about it, uh, we're all going to die eventually, and then what? What, what carries on um, our own life in this world? Well, obviously it's our offspring. Um, and so uh, having a, a family and having children is a way for a man or woman to prolong his or her own life after death, in, in a sense. Um, the third precept of natural law um, is broader than family. Natural sociability, what does this mean? Well, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle had said um, thousands of years earlier that um, every human being has a natural desire to live in a community, um, to be connected to other people beyond even one's own um, family. And in fact, that we can't be happy or fulfilled unless we're part of a community life. Um, and so enlightened thinkers really emphasized the connectedness of human beings and how we were meant to cooperate together in harmony in a broader political community. The fourth principle of natural law, the desire for the truth. Now, obviously, um, the scientific revolution could be seen as an expression of this desire that we human beings have a hunger to know the truth about the world we live in not just in fancy philosophical ways, but even in ordinary ways. I mean, if you think about it, um, we couldn't survive unless we knew certain truths about the world, things that we learned when we were little kids, like um, don't touch a hot iron <laughs> or you'll get burned. Um, the knowledge of what foods are safe to eat and what, and what, what is not safe to eat uh, and so forth. And so uh, St. Thomas said that all human beings have this desire for the truth and we also have a desire for the good, a desire to do good and to avoid evil. Now, that may seem a bit odd at first, because after all, don't we all do evil things or bad things from time to time? How can it be said that human beings have uh, a natural desire from God to do the good at all times? Well, if you think about it <clears throat> a little more deeply, <clears throat> 
why do we do evil? I mean, do we get up in the morning and say, I'm going to do something really evil today? <laughs> I don't think people normally do that. Uh, when we do bad things, it's usually because they seem good to us um, at the time, right? Uh, oh, I'm going to go out uh, and my friends are smoking, so I'm going to smoke, uh, or what have you, because it seems good to me at the time. It seems sociable, companionable, cheerful, or, or whatever. You can think of other types of peer pressure. Um, and uh, so... Uh, you could say that what we do in those cases is to settle for some kind of lesser good um, over the greater good. Um, and so still we're desiring the good, just sometimes we get it wrong about what, um, what is really good for us. Um, all right, so those are the five principles of um, the natural law. And during the Enlightenment period, starting in the late 1600s, European thinkers began to apply those principles to human life and, and to try to come up with scientific explanations of uh, how humans behaved based on this Christian idea of the natural law. However, there's another way you could look at the natural law, uh, maybe a little less theological. Um, Europeans, of course, after the age of exploration, were coming into contact with a great many people uh, throughout the world and uh, learning a lot about different cultures, uh, Africa, Asia, the Americas, and um, how they worked. And they were gathering a lot of data on this. And when enlightened thinkers looked at the information on these other cultures, what they saw was that um, pretty much every culture in the world had similar moral viewpoints. For example, um, every culture in the war world forbids murder. Um, every culture in the world has some kind of institution of marriage. Now, uh, the definitions of morality can change. Like, for instance, some countries allow men to have several wives rather than just one, or, or, or the definition of what is murder varies from place to place. Um, but fundamentally, it seemed to Enlightenment thinkers that people were pretty similar in terms of their moral beliefs. And so um, you could say that around the world, uh, people are following this teaching of natural law, and that the natural law is that it, are, are those teachings which are common to all human cultures once you take away the things that make cultures different. Um, the uh, Frenchmen, Denis Diderot and Jean d'Alembert, uh, set out in the mid-1700s to prove this by publishing all the information that uh, was currently known about all the cultures of the world. And so they produced a massive set of volumes called the Encyclopedia, which um, was widely read throughout Europe. And actually, um, you can read it today on the internet, or at least large parts of it have been translated into English um, and put up on the internet. Now, this should tell us that Europeans did not necessarily look down on and despise all the so-called primitive peoples of the world. In fact, Europeans were often very, very interested in other cultures. And in many cases, Europeans even admired other cultures because when they looked at um, pre-modern societies like the Indians or uh, the natives of South Pacific Islands or whatever, what they saw was people that were really living out the natural law in a very pure way. Um, people that lived a very simple, humble life that were devoted to their families that shared things with each other that weren't, who weren't greedy, uh, so had a very high idea of um, uh, devotion to their community. And uh, a lot of Europeans pointed out, hey, maybe these so-called savages are actually more civilized than Europeans, um, who in many cases were greedy and, and power hungry uh, and corrupt. And so there arose the idea of what's called the noble savage, that um, in some ways maybe Europeans should look to primitive people as an example of, of how to live. Um, and so people read with great interest uh, 
the reports of scientific explorations throughout the world, like those of the British um, Captain James Cook um, in Oceania, those are the islands in uh, the South Pacific around Australia. In fact, Cook was the first European to uh, discover Australia on his voyages. This teaching about natural law had a political element as well, and the political element had very, very important effects throughout the world, and especially here uh, in the United States. Now, looking at those primitive people around the world, enlightened thinkers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who you see pictured here, who was from Switzerland, um, said that people like that are living in what they called a state of nature, uh, a primitive society that doesn't have a real government. But there was a way that even civilized societies could wind up in a state of nature. <clears throat> Let's say that a country like France or England uh, had a ruler who was a tyrant. What is a tyrant? Um, a harsh, cruel ruler who rules according to his own will and not, in, not according to the consent of his people. Uh, what we would call a dictator. Now, if a country had a tyrant, according to these enlightened thinkers, uh, the tyrant was not worthy to be the ruler. And so, um, in a sense, he wasn't the ruler anymore. And the power uh, in such a uh, a situation would then go back to the people. Um, in other words, they had been restored to a state of nature where there was no government. Um, and then it was their duty to create a new government according to the natural law with uh, a good uh, ruler. And in order to do that, according to Rousseau, um, you had to, the people had to make what was called a social contract. They had to agree with each other, just like two business people might agree on a business contract, um, to set up a government that they could all agree on. This is called popular sovereignty. Uh, the idea that the people ultimately are the origin of all government. It's the people um, at the beginning of every society that have to decide what kind of government um, they want so that they can get out of the state of nature and into the state of uh, society. And this is exactly what the American Founding Fathers thought they were doing. They had read Rousseau, they had read all the enlightened, many of the enlightened thinkers that were teaching these theories, and they believed that their king, George III of England, was a tyrant, um, a, a brutal ruler, and so they believed that the power to rule had gone back to the people in the colonies. Um, Patrick Henry of Virginia reflected this when he said in 1774 to the First Continental Congress, quote, we are in a state of nature, sir, end quote. So the colonies, they believed, had fallen back into a state of nature, and then it was their obligation to establish a new government on principles of natural law. And so, in 1776, Thomas Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, in which he refers to the laws of nature and of nature's God. And then, uh, a number of years later, in 1787, the Federal Constitution is drafted, which is like a social contract for our nation. It's the fundamental law of our nation, establishing our government. Um, and so, the founding of the U.S. was very much influenced by this political theory of the Enlightenment. However, um, there was some disagreement um, among enlightened thinkers about how exactly this natural law played out. Um, some thinkers were more optimistic um, about what life was like before government in the state of nature. Uh, John Locke, uh, who, like Rousseau, is one of our authors uh, for this module, um, John Locke, in his two treatises of government, said, quote, in the beginning, all the world was America, end quote. Um, when he looked at the so-called savage uh, Indian tribes of North America, 
Um, he thought the Indians had it pretty good, um, that they were noble savages, and um, that they were living together according to the natural law uh, in relative harmony. For Locke, um, the state of nature then wasn't so bad. In the state of nature, people had certain rights, namely the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to property and that these rights came from God according to the natural law. And so we call them natural rights. Um, again, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson refers to uh, natural uh, rights. Important thing to remember here, though, is that for Locke, once the people get together, establish a social contract, establish a government, they still get to keep those natural rights to life, liberty, and property, and no government can take them away. However, there was another English thinker of the 1600s, Thomas Hobbes, who had a very different view of the state of nature. He said that in the state of nature, it's like a never-ending struggle. He called it the war of every man against every man. And he said that life in the state of nature without a government was nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> um, so he saw the state of nature as very violent and unacceptable, and um, he thought the only way um, for human beings to live together in any kind of peace uh, because of our evil natures was for the people to get together and uh, in their social contract create an absolute king who would rule over them with an iron hand to keep them from fighting each other and getting into mischief. Um, this way of thinking we called enlightened absolutism. The idea that um, it, it's based on the enlightenment theory of the natural law, but it's also based on a very dark view of human nature and the idea that only an absolute king um, or ruler can really control uh, the dark side of human nature and create order in society. And uh, in the next lecture on absolutism, you'll have several examples of this type of ruler in Europe. Hobbes also believed, unlike Locke, that once people made a social contract and created a government, that they lost all of their natural rights to life, liberty, and property. Um, the ruler did not have to respect those rights of individuals. The only rights people had at that point were what we call civil rights. And civil rights are different from natural rights, okay? Um, as we've seen, according to this way of thinking, natural rights come from God, and nobody can take them away. That's why Jefferson says they're unalienable. We can't take, nobody can take them away, we can't even give them away because they are a gift from God. However, civil rights, um, for instance, rights like voting, for example, uh, that's a civil right, come from the government. Um, so if we enter into a, a social contract, if we're part of a government, then the government gives us our civil rights. But that also implies that if the government gave us those rights, the government can take them away. Um, and so for Hobbes, people don't have any rights that the government necessarily has to um, respect because all rights come from the government and the government can take them away. Another uh, enlightened thinker who agreed with this uh, position of Hobbes's was Rousseau. Um, and um, in the reading that we have during this module from the social contract, um, Let's see, which group is that? That'll be group two. You will see that Rousseau teaches, like Hobbes, that once people create a government, they lose all their natural rights, and they only keep whatever rights the government pleases to give them, civil rights. However, unlike Hobbes, who um, envisioned a king, an absolute king at the head of society, um, Rousseau says that the ruler doesn't necessarily have to be an individual. In fact, the ruler in his society is what he calls the general will. That is, the will of all the people um, taken together uh, controls the society. 
and um, you'll see how this plays out, um, group two, um, in, in your reading, and of course I'll talk about it in my video recap uh, at the beginning of module five. A little bit more about natural rights. Okay, so Locke said there were three, life, liberty, and property. So no one could take away your life or your liberty or your property without your consent. Uh, Jefferson changed the third one, property, in the Declaration to Pursuit of Happiness. Um, so we could see that also as a natural right during the Enlightenment. Finally, um, all Enlightened thinkers, um, with a few exceptions, believed that people had a natural right to resist tyrants, to overthrow tyrants who were oppressing them. So there's a natural right of resistance to tyranny. Um, civil rights in uh, the Enlightenment period uh, pretty much comprised all of the other rights you can imagine. Right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, um, freedom of assembly, and especially voting rights were considered to be civil rights. Um, and since they were civil rights, governments could, and often did, restrict them. Um, freedom of speech uh, and freedom of religion especially. And so uh, those rights were not absolute. It's the only absolute rights, according to this way of thinking, are the natural rights, the ones that come to us from God. Now, um, once enlightened thinkers had agreed um, to use the natural law as their blueprint for how society should work, um, they applied uh, this teaching to political science, to the, to the study of political societies. And they tried, uh, in a way, to revolutionize society by saying that all laws, <coughs> all governments should be based on this law of nature and that all governments should respect um, natural, uh, natural rights uh, when they existed. Um, one of the greatest political thinkers of the time was a Frenchman named uh, the Baron de Montesquieu. And uh, in 1748, he came out with a very famous book called The Spirit of Laws, um, in which he uh, depicted human societies in terms of uh, natural law, um, arguing that even though in terms of culture, societies might be very different, um, he said that each society has its own national genius. For instance, the British were uh, good at trade and commerce, and that was their natural um, tendency, whereas other cultures were better at art or uh, war or what have you. So it, different cultures are different but that in its laws, every nation should, um, should follow the natural law and should never do anything um, to violate that. It was Montesquieu who suggested a way to organize government so that the government would be fair and would respect the natural law. And he said that every government should have three different branches, the legislative that makes laws, the executive, that enforces the laws and the judicial branch judges who interpret the laws. Um, and this view was very, very influential on the American founding fathers. You can see in our constitution that they created three branches of government, exactly as Montesquieu um, had recommended. And the goal was to create a very stable government with checks and balances so that no one person or group in the government could uh, become a tyrant and oppress the people. Natural law thinking also had a great influence uh, in terms of economics. Now we already mentioned uh, the mercantile system that was uh, popular before the Enlightenment. The idea that um, each nation should have its own colonial empire so that it could become self-sufficient and so that it would not have to trade with any other country, the mercantile system. Well, um, economists of the Enlightenment really turned this idea on its head um, because they saw it as natural for human beings to want to trade with each other um, throughout the world. They didn't believe that governments should restrict people from their natural sociability. 
their desire to make connections and reach out to other people wherever they were in the world. Um, and so they believed in free trade and they did not believe in the mercantile approach. Uh, there's a famous phrase that sort of sums up this economic view in French, laissez-faire la nature. That just means let nature take its course. In other words, don't try to interfere with people when they want to do business with each other. Don't set up artificial boundaries. Let them trade with each other. Um, the classic book that expresses this um, Enlightenment viewpoint is by a Scotsman named Adam Smith. It's called The Wealth of Nations, and it came out 1776, the same year the U.S. declared its independence. Um, Adam Smith was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, there were many important Enlightenment thinkers who lived in um, Scotland, and what they all had in common was that they really emphasized the third principle of natural law, natural sociability. The idea that people are called to live together in a community and that um, in nature people have a kind of natural kindness to each other benevolence um, and it's only the corruption of our governments that keeps us from expressing that towards each other if you took away government control um, on people and allowed them to let nature take its course people would make peace with each other, they would trade with each other, they would become friends. Um, and so Smith saw business as a way for people of different nations to really reach out to each other to promote um, peace and harmony um, through commerce. And that's what the Wealth of Nations is about. Um, it's a blistering attack on the mercantile system and um, an advocate and in the book, Smith really advocates free trade among all nations. There were a number of institutions during the Enlightenment that promoted this idea um, of natural sociability community. We already talked in the Atlantic World Lecture about coffee houses and the important role um, that they played in terms of spreading the new uh, political ideas of the period. There were also gatherings that were called salons. These were normally run by women in their own houses. Um, in Paris, uh, this, this tendency started, then it spread throughout Europe. Um, so these uh, ladies would invite <clears throat> important enlightened thinkers to their homes and they would discuss uh, up to the minute issues um, and try to plan ways to make progress in society. A third very important place where people came together, where men came together during this period to talk about ideas and about political ideas especially, um, were called Masonic Lodges, and, and these still exist. Um, there are many Americans who are still members of uh, Masonic Lodges. Mason, the Masons are basically a secret society. Um, and the, the origins of it are uh, this group are a little bit murky, um, but it really emerges strongly in the 17th century. Groups of men who get together and they have uh, secret initiations. Um, they even have secret handshakes. <laughs> in a way, it's almost like a fraternity for um, older adults, you know, it's sort of a boys' club. Uh, nowadays, the Masons are mostly just a social club, and they and they do good things for society. For instance, the Shriners, who collect money for kids' charities, are, are Masons. But in the Enlightenment period, uh, Masonry was a hotbed of political thinking. And um, in the age of revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, um, Masons were at the heart of those revolutions. For instance, Benjamin Franklin was um, a Mason. Paul Revere was a Mason. George Washington was a Mason. That's why we have Masonic symbols on our money. If you look at a dollar bill, you will see a pyramid with this weird looking eye over it on the back of the dollar bill. That's a Masonic um, symbol. And so the Masons were really, really influential. Uh, if you've ever seen the old movie National Treasure, that's kind of what that film is about now of course none of the things very almost none of the things in that film are um, are true but it does spring from the truth that the masons were very important um in this enlightenment movement and very important in our own revolution 
What about women? Um, so the Enlightenment was really revolutionizing the way people looked at the world. It was overturning old cherished beliefs from the Middle Ages and uh, coming up with bold new ideas. But in the area of the sexes, um, the Enlightenment really did not make a great many changes from the received view. Uh, because the idea that the man should be the head of the woman and that men should be uh, the rulers of the family seemed to people like Rousseau to have a basis in the natural law, uh, in the natural division of the sexes. Um, and so it, it seemed natural to them that God had created the man as the head and um, the woman in a sense to be sub more submissive or inferior. This didn't mean that um, enlightened thinkers thought women were unimportant. In fact, they thought women had a very important role uh, as part of their plan to revolutionize society. Woman's role was to be a good mother and to educate her children, especially her sons, in um, good principles, morals, virtues, ethics, so that those sons could grow up and be good enlightened citizens of the new republics that these enlightened thinkers wanted um, to build. Now that was a limited role, but, but, but they saw it as a very important role. And so still during the enlightenment, um, thinkers believed that men and women had what were called separate uh, spheres, that uh, man's role was to go out into the world to do business, to participate in politics, his role was, in a sense, out of doors in public, whereas woman's sphere was, of course, in the home, taking care of uh, her husband, taking care of her children, and molding them um, to be good citizens so that they could go out and participate, the boys could go out and participate in this public um, male world. However, there were a few women during the Enlightenment who really questioned this idea of separate spheres, who saw it as very limiting to the talents and potential of women. The most famous was an English woman named um, Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, if that name seems familiar, it may be because she had a daughter um, whose name was Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, and um, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, her daughter, wrote one of the most famous books of the period called Frankenstein, <laughs> uh, which you may have read perhaps uh, already. But the older uh, woman, Mary Wollstonecraft, was one of the very first feminists, and in 1792 uh, she came out with a very important book called The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, in which she argued that um, not only should women get a much better education than they were allowed at the time, not being allowed to go to male universities like Oxford and Cambridge, but they should also be given full rights to participate in voting and running for office and so forth. And this was an incredibly radical view at the time. And uh, even many women were not ready to go along with um, Mary Wollstonecraft on this point. Um, they uh, simply were not ready to accept that great <laughs> of an upheaval, even during the Enlightenment, uh, many women were content with their uh, with the way that things were, as were most men, of course. Um, but Mary Wollstonecraft's book uh, did cause a lot of discussion, um, and it certainly served as, as an inspiration for uh, feminists of later years. <laughs>